started off in week one talking about the presence of God, right? We value presence every time we gather and everywhere we go. Uh, we value family because we follow Jesus together. We value honor. We honor up, down, and all around. We honor power because God is moving today. We've seen that. And today we are doing our last of five core values and we'll do a couple more weeks in the series that are one about our mandates and another just kind of a Holy Ghost message. And uh, we're going to be go- we're, today we're talking about generosity. Everybody say generosity. generosity. Blessed to be a blessing. Can we say that? Good, good. You're already on it. So generosity, we are blessed to be a blessing. And so when we read the book of Genesis where we've been in, you know, the origins of creation. We're also talking about kind of like, why do we exist in church? What has God created here? And, and we, we've been digging through the story a little bit, just kind of using that as a, as a point to move forward. In Genesis chapter 122, it says, then God blessed them, Adam and Eve, God blessed them. Now you could just stop right there because they hadn't done anything. You know, a lot of times we think, well, if I do this, then I'll be blessed. Now, if you live here, there is a place where blessing is flowing, and you need to get in that place, but you don't institute the blessing of God. The blessing of God is already there. It's your job just to get in it, right? And so it says that God blessed them before they did anything, and because God blessed them, he now gives them a mandate to be fruitful and multiply. Come on. Come on, somebody. And it says, and it says this in verse 29. God says this, listen, I have given you, he says, he uses the word look. I I say listen. He says, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. So God creates these trees and and all this stuff, and he he only does it once. Isn't it interesting? God, God God isn't still planting trees. Right, the, tr- the, tr- the, tr- the apple that you may have had for breakfast or, you know, for a healthy snack this week, that tree that it came from, came from a tree that 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 went back to a tree that was in the garden. And so it, it's interesting that, that someone had to take that seed and put that seed into the ground for it to produce more seeds. So... What we learn here is the principle is that God creates seed-bearing things. Did you know that you, humans, are seed-bearing people, right? So we're not going to go through a health class today or, or educate you in that. You, you know how that rolls. So God creates a resource and an ability. But get this, the seed has to be sown. And so when we talk about generosity, a lot of people want to hold on to seeds and they wonder why things aren't happening in their life. It's because you've got a bag of seeds sitting at your house. You're not doing anything with them and you're asking God to bless you. And he's already blessed you in the form of seeds. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse 10, God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. Woo, come on. God will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Now, it doesn't say that you will grow fat with blessing. It says that he will create generosity in you. He says this, yes, you will be enriched in every way. You will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Most of the time when we talk about the promises of God and the provision of God, we view it in a sense of God taking care of me. But listen, God, by taking care of you, is taking care of others. Through his generosity inside of you. This is the way the kingdom of God works. God puts something inside of you that you can eat from, but don't eat all of it. 
Listen, God provides it all. The seed, the bread, the increase, the laws, the physic, the science, all of that. Yeah. God creates those things. I, I, I love what Bill Johnson says. He says is that we don't eat seed and we don't plant bread. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And I, I love that statement because it teaches us something that, you know, you, when you get a paycheck, and, 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 I, and, and I hate it when we have, I, today's the day that I wish no guests show up. Because they don't know us, and they want, oh, there's another preacher talking about money, and they did this weird declaration thing. And, uh, so, are you, and, then, and so the question comes up, are you a prosperity gospel church? No, we're, we're, not a, we're not a prosperity gospel church, but we're also not a poverty gospel church. We are a provision God, gospel church. Come on, and God provides all my needs according to his riches and glory, not according to what I can come up with. So, so, so just get into it that God provides, and he provides good. Because <laughs> he's not po. <laughs> so the problem is, is a lot of times we have, back to our thought, when we have a paycheck, a lot of times we just immediately all that goes to budget. Right? And it's like, well, now my bills are paid and I got like, I've got like 100 bucks left. So I'm going to tip the Lord because church was good today. So I give him $10 of what everything was less left right yeah. or we go to the restaurant and we have a server and they take good care of us and we're like ah, I know there's only $200 in the bank so I'm only going to tip them two bucks so the tab was like 60 bucks and so w what's happening is is you were seeing yourself as first of all that's a it's a scarcity mindset to think I just got to hold on to everything and there's wisdom and all those things we don't want to be foolish but the problem is a lot of times God gives and provides for us seeds and we're eating the seeds. Now listen, there's, God provides bread. You need to eat the bread. There are a lot of it. You know, when, when someone gets blessed extra financially, one of my kids get this, and I learned this principle a long time. My dad taught me this. He's like, when, when you get a, a blessing, he's like, you need, to, you need to buy yourself something. You need to eat some bread, right? But also, it's not all to be eaten. A lot of it is seed to be planted. And this, this is how we partner in the kingdom of God. We partner by planting. Yeah. God gives us a bag of seeds, and he goes, go ahead and go plant it. And don't just plant it in your garden, yeah. right? Come on, spread the seed. And so don't eat the seed. And so my encouragement to you today is stop eating the seed. You have three seeds, because we're not just talking about money, right? Generosity is an attitude. Generosity is a lifestyle. It involves money, yes, but it's not just about money. So I, I want you to, when we say blessed to be a blessing, don't think dollar signs. Think my lifestyle. Yes. And so you have, you, all of us in this room have three resources that God has given us. We have our time. Yes. <laughs> right? That's, that's the hardest one. And in any of these, people say, well, I do that, but I don't do these. You're called to bring, they are all resources that God gave you. So we're, we're, we're called to, to be, to sow the seed of our time. It's difficult. Are you generous with your time? The second seed that we have is our talent. Those would be like your abilities. Can I, can I tell you, some of you are like, I don't know what my talents were. I didn't know what I was talented, what, talented at until I was 18 years old in senior high school. I didn't know what I was good at. Isn't that crazy? And you know what I found? Church is a really good place to find out what your talents are. It's a really good place because you can try, like, you, we have all these areas you can serve in. You can learn who you're good at. Well, I'm definitely not good at kids' ministry. Somebody is. I'm not good at kids' ministry. I'm really bad at it, <laughs> right? No. You, you like coffee? We got, you know, you got, you like talking to people? We got a ministry for that. You like praying for people? We got a ministry for that. You like cleaning? We got a ministry for that. Yeah. You like organizing? We always got a ministry for that. We got a ministry for everything. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people have a gift and they use their gift to make money, but they don't ever use it for seed. And so God has given you that ability. Do you think he just 
gave it so you can make a paycheck. And listen, you are to make a paycheck, and you are to do something with what comes from that too. But also, did you know that God has given you that gift so you can use it for his kingdom? Yeah. Not just to make money, not just to give money. And that's, that's a good way, healthy way to look at it. The problem is, is we've treated church like, a, like consumers, yeah. right? I, lo- I love the message. And people do their giving like this. The message is good today. Here, I'll give $10. And I'm not, I'm not being critical. You've got to start somewhere. But listen, in church, the big, what is the biggest problem in the American church? And everybody's got a list. I think the biggest problem is the consumer mindset, which is, I want to go to, I've got, I can get on Google, and I'm, I'm glad you got on Google and you found the church. Most of us, 90% of us found us on Google, right? I'm glad you did that. But, but we, when we go to Google, we have, we have 50 options within five miles, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a really good thing that there's options. However, we go, well, I, I'll go to that one. I, I like this. I don't like that. I go to this one. I like this. I like that. Listen, everywhere you go, there's going to be things that you don't like. It's just the way it is. It's, not, it's because we've, we've been trained to be consumers. We've been trained to be picky. <laughs> and so we don't really belong to a house. We just go and we consume what the house is offering. And so my encouragement to you is, is bring your gifts. Yeah. Sign up with Pastor Brooke. I mean, get in on volunteering. Yeah. You say, well, I, I can't do anything on Sundays. I can barely make it on Sundays. Well, then come up during the week and walk around and pick up trash. You know, wh- whatever it is, something. Yeah. Yeah. Something. Eventually, you have to give back or you stop receiving. Yeah. It's just the way it is. Don't eat the seed of your talent. So it is your destiny should I serve it at my church? Yes. Listen, if you are not serving your local church at some level, you are not fulfilling God's best for your life. I'm, I, I'm, I say that carefully and lovingly. But if you are not bringing your gifts and abilities to the kingdom of God, you are not just robbing the kingdom. You're robbing yourself. Because eventually you're just going to fall into this consumer mindset. This is, I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it. I keep coming back because I like it, I like it, I like it. And then it's going to cap out and you're going to be like, oh, it's good. I really like it, but not so much anymore. Why? Because you're not giving anything back because you've been eating seed. So, so figure out a way to apply your talent. The third is this. And talent, listen, talent, sometimes, sometimes people think they're talented in areas that they're not talented in. And so church, church, is also, church is also a good place to find out what you're not talented in. I mean, everybody thinks they can sing. I mean, we've all watched American Idol, and we're like, who told them they could sing? You know, or whatever the singing program is this week. <laughs> all right. The Lord loves it when you sing, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily a blessing to everyone else. I'll let, I'll, I'll let Pastor Nathan deal with that. So if you, yeah. <laughs> All right. Now the, the, the third area is this, is our treasure. And that, that, that's your money. Here's, here's the deal. We don't serve money. Right. Right. Our, our society has taught you to do that. We don't serve money. Money serves us. And what I've found about money is money is a great servant, but a terrible master. Wherever you're at in your life, don't just go after the thing that you can make the most money at. There are a lot of, listen, I could have done a lot of things and made a lot more money in my life, but I've devoted my life to ministry and it's not super lucrative. (laughs) Do what God has called you to do. do. Do something that God has put in your heart. Do that. Yes. And sometimes you have to, I have, a, I have a saying with people, as I say, sometimes you have to do what's in your hand before you can do what's in your heart. Yes. And sometimes you have to do what's in your hand before you can do what's on your heart. Yes. Sometimes you find out what's in your heart by doing what's in your hand. Yes. Whatever you do, just do it as unto the Lord. Yes. And then God will start revealing some things. So money is... Money will help, but, it, but it's not, but it, but not going to make you satisfied. Yeah, yeah. It's a terrible master. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Money, money, is, money is an indicator. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is why people get mad when the church talks about money. 
Did you know that Jesus talked about money a ton? He used money in illustrations. Jesus talked about people didn't get mad at him. But people get mad when the church talks about money. We say, because it's been abused. No, because the God of our culture is mammon, which is the God of wealth. Or the God, really the God of materialism and greed. That, that is the, what is the God of the sex God? The, the greatest God in our nation is, 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 is the driving force of money. It's greed. I want more. I want more. I want more. It's materialism. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God and mammon. Or you cannot serve God and money. We know that money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money not money, but the love of money, right? There's a difference between having money. You need money. Yeah. Some of y'all need to get a job and make more money. <laughs> but money isn't the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. So it's when we love it. It's when we become materialistic. So money is an indicator. It shows where your heart is. That's what people don't like about it. like it when we talk about it in church. Bring it down. You got that wrong. We got that wrong. It's like money also is an influencer. Did you know the greatest way that you lead your heart is through your giving? Think about things that you pay for. And you're like, I pay for that. I need to use it. If you're responsible, this is the way you think, right? You sign up for a gym membership, right? Some of y'all wasting money. <laughs> it's not good stewardship. I go to the gym half the time because I need to go work out. The other half of the time is because I paid that money and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, right? And so money influences our heart. It, it leads us in a way. And this is why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So basically, he's saying you put your treasure there and your heart follows it. It's like, so peop people, there's been people over the years that just come to church, come to church, come to church, don't give anything, don't give anything, don't give anything, don't give anything. And they complain and they talk about what they don't like and they're uninvested and all this kind of stuff. They're inconsistent. It's like, wow, what was, they haven't led their heart. They're not invested. And I don't say that as a criticism. It's just an observation. Yeah. Understand, today, as, as we talk about this, my agenda is not to get money from you. We're not going to take up another offering. <laughs> We're not going to do that. So I'm not trying to twist your arm. I, I'm not trying to get from you. I'm trying to help you right. learn to be a generous person yeah. because it's the best way to live. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get you in a moment of generosity, but get you into a lifestyle of generosity. So those three, right? So those three things that we're talking about is time, oh, talent, and treasure. All those things we're called to be generous in. Money is just a really good measuring stick for, the, for all of them. Why do we want to be generous? Well, number one, because we want to be like him. <laughs> God is generous. I mean, the, the greatest quote, of, you know, you'll probably see a sign if you watch the Super Bowl later. Someone holding up a sign. This is John 3, 16. It's the most famous scripture. What does it say? God so loved the world that he gave. gave. There's not a greater act of generosity than Jesus. Jesus is the greatest act of generosity. Heaven was bankrupt. When Jesus steps off the throne and on to planet Earth to come and humble himself. I mean, what a generous God. The gospel is about God's generosity. And we want to be like him. You know, you can, you can give without love, but you can't love without giving. Right? You can't love without giving. You say, yeah, you can. Well, you tell your spouse that. They'll tell you. Well, my, my love language is it, you, you, you got to give something. Right? So the first reason why we want to be generous is because we want to be like him. The second reason is because we are blessed. Everybody say, I am blessed. I am blessed. 
Right? I'm not talking about the Hobby Lobby picture. I'm not talking about the meme that you shared. I'm talking about you are, did you know that you're really blessed? Yeah. You said, uh, uh, I don't know. Well, sit down, get away from your phone, get out a piece of paper, and just start writing down all the things that you have in your life. And I guarantee you that that list will be longer. Even if you're not doing so well financially, that list will be longer than all the things that you don't have. And we have, especially in America, man, we're so, we, we have so much. It's so, so, so many things in the West that we, that we don't, we, we talk about how we're struggling. But you, we don't know struggle. You are blessed. Um, Jesus makes a statement, Matthew 10, 8, freely you've received, freely give. Freely you receive, freely give. Freely give forgiveness. <laughs> let's, let's just dig to the hardest thing. How can you forgive others? Because you've been forgiven. How can you give? Because you've received. I want you to start acting like you're blessed. Not just quoting it. Not, listen, not being a diva. We've dealt with that. Not being like, I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> listen, I know. We all know. But act truly blessed to be a blessing. That's why you're blessed. Um, our value is not accumulation. It's not about getting a fatter bank account. Nothing wrong with fat bank accounts as long as you're not just getting more and just filling the bank account. I just want to have more. I just want to have more. That's called materialism. Why? Why do you want more? You know, we do this offering declaration. We've been doing it since we started having services as a church. It's the most controversial thing that we've done as a church. We've had uh, conversations at our dinner table talking about it. We've had people leave the church and then complain about it. It's weird because they were in the church. We were doing it the whole time. And then all of a sudden now, but now they don't like it. And it's just become a point, a little bit of tension. And some of y'all probably still aren't there yet with the offering declaration. It's like, why, 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 do you, why do we have to do that? Or why can't we add it? Or why can't we change to it? Or, you know, all this kind of stuff. It, this is... It's, it's been a thing that we've had to, like, wrestle with and go, do we keep it? And we're like, we do. Why do we keep it? Because we believe that God, we believe in the things that we're saying. We believe that those are true. So that's why we say it. It's not a name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, all that. No, it's not that. So we can be blessed to be a blessing. And so we declare those things because sometimes we don't believe those things, so we're saying it, so we will believe it. And you know what we see all the time? Checks in the mail, final money. All the things that we declare, we see them on a weekly basis. And so we're not just, you know, saying all these empty words. So we're keeping it. We're keeping the offering declaration. If that's a thing, it's like, a, they would quit doing that. I'll, I'll you know, I, I, would, I would go through the deeper track. I'd go through membership if they would just quit doing that. We're not going to quit doing that. We're just going to keep doing it. And uh, we're not trying to be seeker sensitive. We're trying to empower people uh, to encounter Jesus. And we want to see them encounter the Lord in their finances. So. We're keeping it because we believe we're blessed to be a blessing. So this is the promise to Abraham. Did you know that the, 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 the promise to be blessed was actually given to Abraham? And we've, we've inherited that in a lot of ways. Scriptures teach this. He says this. God says, I will make you a great nation. Genesis 12. I will make you famous, not famous like you think. And you will be a blessing to others. So the point of it all is to get you to this place where you're a blessing to others. That when you show up and you've had a hard day, you can still be a blessing to others because you have an overflow in your heart of generosity. I, I make it a point when people are working jobs that I wouldn't want to have to make them feel like that their job is, is, is better than it maybe is. I want to add value to every person I'm around. Why? Because I'm, my heart is full. I'm fully forgiven. I'm a son of God. I'm a, I'm a prince in God's kingdom. Women, you're princesses in God's kingdom. You're not queen. Oh, let's just remember, remind you that. But you are, listen, you are highly valued of God. And, and because of that, you can add value to other people. And what I've found is if, if I will be generous in that economy in my heart, what happens is my heart just gets bigger. Like, I, I've never been, been nice to someone when I didn't feel like I'd walk away and go, man, I really wish I wasn't nice to that person. <laughs> if anything, it elevates my attitude. I'm like, oh, man, I'm, so, I'm glad that I could get a smile out of that person because they weren't smiling when I showed up. Yeah. 
It's just, it's just a lifestyle. This is what generosity looks like. And beloved, you can, you can afford it. You can afford it. You can, be a, you can afford to be nice to people that are mean to you. <laughs> I mean, this is the kingdom. You can be nice to people that hate you. Okay. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul goes into 2 Corinthians 8 and chapter 9. We're going to spend a little bit of time on both of those today. And he's talking to the Macedonian church. Now, this church was very poor financially, but they were rich. They were rich in the kingdom. And Paul talks about that. So get this, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And he's talking to the Corinthian church, but he's referencing the Macedonian church. Now, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles. And they are very poor. But. It's hard. I mean, they're at the bottom. They are in the struggle, but they are also filled with abundant joy. So which is it? Yes, you can have joy in the struggle. Which has overflowed in rich generosity. If they're poor, how can they be generous? For I can testify that they not only gave what they could afford, but far more. And they did it out of their own free will, meaning they didn't do it because someone forced them to do it. They did it because they had an overflow in their heart to be generous. And God saw that. And so one of the common objectives we have with generosity is is we say, well, I would be generous if I had more. If I was rich, I could help people. And what I found is that people that don't start that when they're poor don't do it when they're rich. If you're generous with what you had, maybe you would have more to be generous with. And so we have this economy scale that we live in, and we're like, oh, man, the economy's bad and all these things. I just can't be generous. I can't be faithful in that. So I'll do something else. And I would say that God is after more than your money. Understand God is after you. He's after your heart. Get this. If you make $50,000 a year and your household has two adults and two children, That's not enough money. It doesn't sound like enough money to to raise two kids, a family. That's not a lot. But did you know if you make $50,000 a year that you are richer than 80% of the planet? We're not going to go do a poll on how much you make, but you can go through and you can look and you can, you can see that if you're making like six, if you're making 50,000 and you don't have a wife and you don't have kids, did you know that you're like in the top 90%? You're on the rich list. They should, they should be writing about you in Forbes. If, <laughs> right? It, if it was a global, you would be on that list. But instead, we talk about rich people problems, right? Your AC isn't working in your car. Do you know if you have a car, you're in the top 3% of the world? Just by having a car. We, our, our clothes go out of style. And we got a closet full of clothes that we don't wear. We have little houses in our house that our clothes stay in, our clothes that we don't wear. And we talk about how we don't have enough. It's a rich people problem. It's a rich people problem to complain about Starbucks because they misspelled your name on your $6 latte. That's a rich people problem. Being rich, listen, has little to do with money. Neither does poverty. So in fact, some people are so poor, all they have is money. I didn't come up with that. Somebody else did. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Did you know that say, you know, if I could just win the lottery, right? If I could just get a big, big tax return, that will take care of all my issues. Did you know that 70% of the people that win the lottery end up, end up bankrupt in two to three years? 70% of people that win the lottery, they don't sow any seed. See, in the kingdom, wealth is measured by generosity 
and poverty by greed. And greed will always cost you more than being generous. It will always cost you more. Being greedy, being concerned, being, being stressed out, being a slave to money, all those things, it will always cost you more than being generous, always, every time. And more than just your pocketbook, it'll really mess with your heart. Y'all okay? Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So he says this. He says, since you excel in so many ways. He's like, I'm proud of you. You're doing good. A plus. You're doing really good in your faith, in your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us. I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. So he's like, you're doing really good. You're performing well. You're loving the, the, the lost. You're, you're speaking well. You have good sermons. You have good theology. You're doing really good in all these areas. Also, I want you to be good in your giving. And kind of what we do sometimes is we go, okay, I, I give the Lord this. 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 But in this area, no. I sh- and we go, oh, I struggle with that. And so Paul's admonishment here is, listen, also be good in this. For I am not commanding you to do this. Get, get the heart here. It's, not, it's a free will thing. Yeah. He says, I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing. Oh, again, money's an indicator. But I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it. Comparison? Yes, right here. I'm comparing your generosity. We hate that word comparison. But here, right here, Paul is saying, listen, you need to compare yourselves to other people and see if you're being as generous as they are. but I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches. You know how the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, there it is, you're blessed. Though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor so that by his poverty he would make you rich. And rich in every way is what he's talking about. And he is, is Jesus talking about money? Yes, he is also talking about money. Now, it might not be rich like you think, hot tubs and whatever Hollywood has painted, but that you have more than enough at all times to be generous in every way. This is where God wants you to live. So how do we grow in generosity? He continues, verse 6. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So give a little, get a little, what he's saying. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And do not give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Come on. In other words, the preacher, you get on there. You'll get a blessing if you give in $1,000. You're going to get a tenfold blessing. He's not talking about that. Giving into that. It's like playing the lottery. It's kind of what that is. All right. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need with plenty left over to share with others. Seed and bread. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer, then bread to eat. Seed and bread. In other words, don't give it all away you got to eat. In the same way, it will provide and increase your resources, time, talent, treasure, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So God is growing in us generosity through us sowing. Yes, you will be enriched in every way, all the ways that you may be generous. So he gives us this model, and this is the way he instructs us to give. Number one, cheerfully. (laughs) <laughs> Again, generosity is an attitude. You must decide in your heart how much to give and do not give reluctantly or in response to pressure. You must decide. You must decide. Not if you give, but how much to give. You decide. Not reluctantly. The, the, if you will look up reluctantly, it means this. Not unwilling nor hesitant. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Hold, 
hold on, hold on, hold on. Right? Talking yourself out of it. The third is this. He says, under pressure. And really what he's talking about here, and we, and we can get into the whole, like, you know, give right now. You got to give. You know, this whole religious thing. He's talking about trying to impress others. So from my understanding, in the temple, where, where the, the common area where anybody could go into the temple, this is where the, the, the widow that had the two mites was in. There were two chests in, in, in this place. And then the, one chest was for your, what you had to give. This is where the tithe went. And there, the other box is what's called free will giving. And so in that one is where you put the other giving. And what was happening... And so that would be where you're, this is demanded, this is where you're generous. Does that make sense? And so they had this, this system. And so what would happen is religious people would go in and they would give in that one to be seen. And so there was this pressure because you're in a public space and people are looking at you, seeing how religious or how devoted you are to go and give to be generous. And he's saying, I don't want you to give under that kind of compulsion. Don't give to be seen. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know, know what your right hand is doing. But you just be generous about it and we're not doing it to be seen. We're not doing it to be noticed. We're doing it to be gracious and to be generous. This is why we're giving. And so some people have taken this verse and they go, well, that just means give what, not under pressure, just do whatever you feel like doing. Can I tell you, and you already know this, that your feelings are never the best indicator to do the right thing? This is why he says before that, you must decide. So decide ahead of time. Don't decide in the moment. Decide ahead of a time, ahead of time. Because sometimes you will feel under compulsion. You know what that's called? The Holy Spirit. Sometimes he will move your heart and provoke your heart. That's the good kind of pressure. And so you've got to discern which is, am I doing it to be seen or to be noticed or to be recognized? Those are all bad motivators. Don't do it. Get your heart right and then do it. And do it in the right way. Secondly, he talks about us consistently. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he says, on the first day of each week. That's why we take offerings on Sunday. You should put aside a portion of money that you've earned. So he's saying, listen, you, you are doing it regularly, consistently. So we do it cheerfully. We do it consistently. So you've got to decide now what you will do then. And so for these, these people, they didn't have, you know, it was just sell the money in. No, they had to set it aside. I mean, imagine how difficult that is to have like an extra, you know, 200 bucks in your pocket. And I'm going to take us to church on me on Sunday. No, they, they put it aside so it don't get spent, right? And then they show up, and then it's like I had already decided. It was, a, it was a decision that I made long ago. And so Proverbs, so, so decide now. And so the, 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 the model that we have throughout the Scripture is the tithe. Some people don't like that word. Well, then just call it the first fruit. Because the first fruit or the tithe were both instituted way before the law was. And when you talk about Malachi, Malachi isn't in the law. Malachi is another. And he says, if you tithe, God will open up the windows of heaven. God will rebuke the devourer. Right. So, so people are like, well, Jesus never talked about tithing. Jesus did reference tithing to the religious people in Luke eleven forty two. And did you know it is the only thing that Jesus complimented the religious on? He's like, you give and it's good. It's the only thing he ever said was good is that they gave. Did you know in, in Luke chapter 20, verse 20, Jesus says, give, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. We love that part, but he says, give to God what is God's. Because God, the tithe was already considered God's. And so when Malachi talks about robbing God, it's like, what happens when you take something that doesn't belong to you? It's called stealing. And so the tithe already, but God already has that 10% that, that, that you go and earn, that already belongs to God. So if you withhold it, you're robbing from him. We had a guy years ago when, when the church started and he had golf clubs and he left them in our house. He said, well, can I leave them in your house? So we put them up in the attic. I probably could have sold those golf cards, those, did I say golf cards, golf clubs, whatever they're called, those things that you hit the ball with. And so he had them in our attic for like a year. They weren't mine. They were just in my house. And so if I would have sold them, that would have been stealing because he just put them in my house. That doesn't make it mine. Because you know the tithe is in your house. The tithe is in your bank account. Whether you yield it to the Lord or not, that's up to you. 
But just know that when you withhold, you close the windows of heaven. This is what it says in Malachi. So I would rather live on 90% blessed, which scripture says, if you don't tithe it, your finances are cursed. I'd rather live 90% blessed than 100%. And so the tithe is the floor, the 10%. So some people are like, most people that are against tithing, what you find is they don't really give anything. Or they give like 10 bucks every now and again. And uh, that's not a good way to live. That's what God calls us to. So if you don't like the word tithe, use the word the first fruit. So that, that's a good one. As it says in Proverbs, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruit of all that you have. Okay? And I would say that all you have, time, talent, and treasure, all of that. The third way is sacrificially. Y'all okay? Yeah. We're really teaching today. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. They gave not what only they could afford, but so much more. So, so when we give, when we're being generous, it's also sacrificial. Which doesn't sound too much like, well, if you're feeling like it, <laughs> whoever feels like making a sacrifice. Did you know that David said, I would not offer God anything that cost me nothing. Like there, there is this place in our hearts that says, man, it should hurt a little bit. That's what it means to give sacrifice. God gave sacrificially. Jesus gave sacrificially. Yet cheerfully. And did you know that God wants you to give sacrificially? Not like the religious words like, oh, it's just so hard to give. No, they're like, oh, man. Can't wait to see what God's going to do through that seed that I just planted. Can't wait to see the tree that's going to spring up. I'm doing it cheerfully because I know that I can't outgive God. So I'm just going to go ahead and give this away. Cheerfully. Did you know that it says in Isaiah 53 that it says that it pleased the Lord to crush Jesus? For the joy that was set before him, even though it was a hard, hard, hard thing for Jesus to do, he did it with a delighted heart. Because? Because he knew what he was getting in return. He knew he was getting us. Come on. And so, again, God doesn't need your money. He wants you. And so when we give our money, it's like, oh, that's really hard to give. It's an altar. It's a place of sacrifice. So in generosity, sacrifices are more pleasurable than painful. So it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to do that. It's hard for me to budget that. But we can do it. So in sacrifice, know this, is that God changes us. God changes us in sacrifice. So when we uh, first moved out here to plant the church, I listened to a Bill Johnson message, and he was saying that they never taught less than 20%. And I was like, dang. I got like, it was like under compulsion kind of type thing. I was like, oh, it's hard. It's heavy. Because immediately I was like, I I need to do more because I was like 10% God. We've been faithful. God's provided. And I, and I, and this is right after we started the church. We, we didn't have any money. We didn't have a full time. Like I had all these little jobs, all this money coming from different places. We, it's hard to set a budget. It was hard, but I felt like the Lord is calling us to start tithing 15%. Really it's 10% tithe and the 5% giving every single month. We just decided in our heart, we we're going to do it. And we didn't, we didn't have a deep conversation. I said, this is what I feel like we're supposed to do. Let's, all right, let's do it. So we did it, which is by the way, it's good to run that stuff by your spouse. And so if you want to stay married, you should probably run major decisions like that by yourself. So we did. And did you know that we didn't have anybody sign on our pitch check? We signed our own pitch check. And it was the best year that we ever had financially. It, was, it, it took more faith than any other year of our life, the best year we ever had financially whenever we started doing that. It was just crazy. We just, we just saw the increase because you can't out give God. And so we need to be generous. And that's what it was. This is an act of generosity. It was like, we're, we're tithing. We, we, it belongs to God. It's his. I'm not going to keep it. But I want to give on top of that. I want, I want to be consistent in that. So developing a generous spirit. Real quick, I'm going to run through these real fast. Y'all okay? Yeah. You getting hungry? All right, I'll get it. <laughs> developing a generous spirit, number one, give thanks. Generosity starts with gratitude. Gratefulness fuels a spirit of generosity. And so you just, you got to be grateful for what you have. If you're ungrateful, you're not, you're not going to be generous. Number two, give something. What are you deciding? What have you decided in your heart? Your time, your talent, your treasures. Give something. We used to have, 
one of, one of the things that rocked me early on in my ministry is we, I youth pastored in Odessa, Texas, in kind of the hood. And we had, we bust all of our kids in. It was just, it was like an inner city type ministry. And we would take up offerings in our youth services. And some people say, they're poor. You shouldn't be taking up offerings. Well, I wanted them to learn, yeah. even though that they were struggling, that they, that they could be generous. And so, I mean, the offerings were like, like $3, and it was all change, right? And this was years ago before we had apps and, and all this stuff. And so we had passed the buckets. And one night, I got there, and I count the offering, and I put it in an envelope, and I, you know, give it to the, 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 the main office at the church. And so I opened up the offering bucket to, put, to count the money and put it away. And there were like, I noticed that things started showing up with the offering. They were like lollipops, and they were like Blockbuster gift cards. You know what Blockbuster is? Uh, blockbuster gift cards. And there were just all these little things. And I was like, what is going on? Why are they putting out? And at first I was kind of like a little bit sarcastic about it. A lot of times I'm like that when God speaks to me. I'm get a little bit, you know, get a little bit critical on the front end. I was like, why are they putting out something in the offering? And I was like, oh, they're giving what they have. They didn't have any money, but they had some blow pops. They didn't have any money, but they had... I had a Blockbuster gift card with like $2.50 left on it. And they gave out of their heart. They gave something. And I just, I was so moved. I just remember being so moved that they, that, that they wanted to give the Lord something. So give something. What are, you, what are you deciding? Number three, give sacrificially. Some of this is a review. Give till it hurts. Does it hurt to give? Or do you only give what's comfortable? That's not sacrificially. Give till it hurts. Number four, give consistently. Start tithing. Oh, man, I couldn't do that. Well, then start somewhere. Start at 2%. Next month, 3%. Grow it. Number four, give consistently. Did I already say that? Yeah. Number five, give from this day forward. Just decide I'm going to be a giver, not just with my money, but with my attitude. I'm going to give my talents. Sign up. Get on the team. I'm going to give some of my time. What do you have to give to the Lord? Give something. What happens first, the planting or the harvesting? The planting always happens before the harvest. Thank you for joining us at Overflow Church today. We hope that you are encouraged and encountered the reality of Jesus. If you did, please let us know in the comments. And make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything that we have coming up. Have a great day.